We continue to receive the news that there are many of our family members and friends around the world who are very ill and particularly one lady in India. We also know of one other young very, uh, one very young girl who's also very ill. Please let us join each other in du'a and sincerely ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a very quick intercession for them and recovery to full health and for all of those people around the world who are in need. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Amma yujibu al-mustarr idha da'aha wa yakshifu as-su' Amma yujibu al-mustarr idha da'aha wa yakshifu as-su' Amma yujibu al-mustarr idha da'aha wa yakshifu as-su' Amma yujibu al-mustarr idha da'a wa yakshifu as-su' Amma yujibu al-mustarr idha da'a wa yakshifu as-su' Bi rahmatika ya arham al-rahimin Salawat A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعن الله ولا الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقط أما بعد قال إمام الحج عليه السلام الحمد لله على حلمه بعد علمه والحمد لله على عفوه بعد قدرته والحمد لله على طول أناته في غضبه وهو قادر على ما يريد الحمد لله خالق الخالق باسط الرزق فالق الإصباح ذي الجلال والإكرام والفضل والإنعام الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى سلوات Awaited savior of our time, Imam al-Zamana My respected teachers, elders, brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh We continue our discussion where we left off yesterday upon the line which says all praise belongs to Allah who is the creator of all things that are created which comes to us from Da'a Iftitah from the Imam of our time Imam Al-Mahdi Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Faraj Al-Sharif Yesterday we stated that because the Dua is split into two sections the first half is a praise to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and the second half is a praise to the divine leaders that this particular section or this particular line of the first half of the dua is arguably the most important line in the first half of the dua because if we are able to correctly understand this part of the dua in theory we should understand everything because it pertains to our own existence hence yesterday we started the discussion However, we left many things that we need to build upon. 
Hence this evening inshallah we will continue to discuss this angle as to the philosophical reason for our own existence. Yesterday we brought several issues and mentioned several aspects of our cognition. And therefore it is worthy for us to spend five minutes just recapping what we said and then building upon these and asking more pertinent questions having already built this particular platform. We stated yesterday that when it comes to the question of my own existence, this should be the most fundamental question. Because if I understand my role within existence, I will successfully be able to circumnavigate any particular issues in my existence. I should be able, in theory, to come to the conclusion of my existence in a worthy manner. And as such, this question is a question that is asked by all of us. Whether I be young or whether I be old, whether I be Shia or non-Shia, Muslim or non-Muslim, and indeed atheists are probably amongst the group that would ask this question the most. Because if you believe in a creator and sustainer, you normally bring your question and answer back towards him. Whereas if you are not a believer in God, it is a most difficult question to answer. Why am I existing? Why am I on this earth? What is my role within these 70 years that I have been given? And as such, we started by asking these questions on a very personal basis. Why am I me? Why am I not you? Why am I born into the era that I am born into? Why was I not born 1400 years ago as a companion of the fifth Imam, for example? Why was I not born in Canada? Why was I not born in Malaysia? What is the reason I am born into my own community, my own circumstance, and indeed my own family? We pose the question in context by saying, is this coincidental? Is this haphazard by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it was just at random measure that you became you and I became me? Is that a befitting comment to place to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is not aware, not in control, does not have a balance for everything in existence and all of this was just a haphazard, coincidental means for me to be born as me? The fact that I cannot label this accusation at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negates the potential. I cannot say that it is randomized. I cannot say that it is coincidental. By virtue of me negating this potential, I must affirm the outcome that he has a plan for me as an individual and everything is geared towards my own existence as the individual that I am. We stated that there is a verse of Quran that expresses the beauty of this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْتَ النَّشْأَةُ الْأُولَى فَلَوْلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ And certainly you are aware of your first period of existence, will you not then bring to mind? This first period of existence is the one in the womb. And this period in the womb, we find that this fetus has a unidirectional purpose. Unidirectional means it's going in one trend. It's going in one way. There is no changing this way that the fetus is made to develop. We find that the universe is unidirectional. This universe started from a small seed. It expanded and expanded, it grew and it grew until it had all that existed within it which exists today. We stated that universe is unidirectional. We stated that religion is also unidirectional. From the time of Nabi Allah Adam alayhi salam, he was able to clothe religion in accordance with how people of his time understood it. When Nabi Allah Nuh alayhi salam came, he was able to break forth, bring religion to a new pedestal. When the next great Prophet Ibrahim salam came, he again burst forth. It was the same religion. I am the same individual, but I am bursting forth in exactly the same way. Nabi Allah Adam, Nabi Allah Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, until the Prophet of our time, until the point of its perfection, at the time of the commander of the faithful. Here we see this unidirectional trend where when I reach a certain point in my existence, the concept is to burst forth into the next stage of my existence. Hence the womb is doing exactly the same thing. The fetus is being clothed by Allah. 
it is now being given shape by Allah until at the end of its pregnancy it is ready to burst forth into the next stage of its own existence we are exactly the same I am a toddler I am a child I am a young person I am an adolescent then I become a teen then I become an adult then I become a weak human being again I come back to this point where I'm an elderly man can I not see that I'm continuously growing I cannot stop this growth process I am bursting forth at every stage of my existence whether I like it or not I have no control over it it is unidirectional the only difference is that I am going to be given birth again into the next stage of existence the same way the fetus was tasked with becoming a complete baby a complete fetus in order to live properly within this world I am being tasked with becoming a complete human being in this world so when I'm given birth to in the next lap of my next mother Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I am capable of beholding existence in the next realm of existence I am worthy of living in heaven rather than living somewhere which is not befitting of an existence like a human being having understood this we mentioned two names yesterday that we need to re-clarify and then build upon we stated yesterday about the story of Nabi Allah Musa alayhi salam and Nabi Allah Ibrahim alayhi salam we want to just go over this again so we can really understand this from Quran when it comes to the story of Nabi Allah Musa alayhi salam we stated that nothing was coincidental because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is planning at every stage for the perfection of Musa alayhi salam he is planning for the perfection of Ibrahim alayhi salam he wants him to grow in accordance with his own challenges in accordance with his own time that he lives in when it comes to the childhood of Musa alayhi salam we see the incident where he is burnt on his tongue was this a coincidence was this a haphazard incident was Allah ta'ala not aware of this incident did he not know this incident was going to take place of course not we cannot label this accusation at the almighty creator and sustainer he was indeed aware of Musa alayhi salam why did this happen because later on in Musa alayhi salam's existence this incident was going to come about again in order to present him at the very esteem and pinnacle of his own existence the fact that he had a tongue which was burnt meant that he wasn't as eloquent as another person his tongue stopped him in being able to be eloquent like maybe another person the result of this was when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him go towards Fir'aun present yourself present my own religion and bring Fir'aun his ministers his magician his followers and the whole of Banu Israel towards Islam you must do so with your own tongue I want you to speak to him argue with him debate with him and disprove him that he is not the Almighty Allah when he says Ana Rabbukum al he is not go ahead and disprove him I am Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Musa alayhi salam knowing his speech impediment knowing the physical defect that he had responds by saying my Lord I fear that Musa uh, that Fir'aun will not be able to listen to me he will not take me seriously because of the speech impediment that I have look at the state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting Musa into he is challenging him to the very core of the individual that he is I recognize that you have a weakness I recognize that there is a physical defect and impediment upon you do not fear burst forth be confident in who you are break forth from the shackles that are upon you spiritually intellectually whatever physically emotionally that you and I have break forth from these shackles that hold you as a human being in the same way Musa alayhi salam is being challenged break forth do not concede to Fir'aun even if you do have this speech impediment the response from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inna ma'akum mustami'oon indeed we are listening to you I have full confidence in you I don't care whether you have a speech impediment or not 
this defect should not stop you in becoming who you are. It should not stop you in bringing about Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahin al Munkar. There is no reason as to why such an impediment should play on your mind. You are Musa, he is Fir'aun, you are superior. Go and give to him the message as it is ordained to you. Now here the problem is when we read these verses of Qur'an, unfortunately we read them as parrots. We know these stories, we teach our children these stories, we hear these stories from pulpit year after year after year. But when I look at these stories, there is an existential point about these stories. There is a very basic fundamental aspect in that that story is for me as an individual. The Qur'an is for me, and the Qur'an is for you. The Qur'an is for everyone in existence. Why? It's not a storybook. It's not got pictures to it. It's not going to be reprinted by another publisher. The Qur'an is a lesson for me to take and understand. If I put myself in Musa alayhi salam's shoes, could I honestly stand in front of Fir'aun? Bring it to your own level. When I see bullying in school, at that point, I am Musa and the bully is Fir'aun. When I see bullying in university, I become Musa in my own time and the bully in the university becomes Fir'aun. When I see bullying in the world of work, I again become Musa and the bully becomes Fir'aun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling me, I am Musa in the Quran at this point. Whatever impediment you have, if you have a lack of confidence, if you are scared to tell this individual, no, do not bully. Allah is saying, Inna ma'akum mustami'oon. Go and speak to the bully. I am listening to you. Have confidence in the next stage of your existence. And it grows. Look at the people in Qatif. Look at the people in Saudi Arabia. Look at the people in Bahrain. They are Musa and they are fighting their own Fir'aun of the 21st century. They within themselves are being challenged to the core of who they are. Bullets will fly. Tanks will roll over your body. But Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahin al Munkar comes first, nothing else. I am Musa. You are Fir'aun. It doesn't matter how scared I am. I will stand in front of you and say to you that I will not allow a bully to be a bully. I am Musa and you are Fir'aun. When I read the Quran in this light, I realize the story of Musa alayhi salam is my story. It is really about me growing. It is really seeing how Musa alayhi salam grew. My God, if Allah Jalla Jalaluhu can show us how a prophet of his can grow into the next stage of his existence. How can I not realize that I am duty bound to grow into the next stage of my own existence? I am weak, my Lord. I recognize my weaknesses. You know my weaknesses. None of this is coincidental in my life. You have given me this life for the purpose of me breaking forth into whom I can eventually become. The same thing happens with Nabi Allah Ibrahim alayhi salam. Think about this story for yourselves. Imagine, put yourself in the place of Nabi Allah Ibrahim. He says, my Lord, I want more yaqeen in you. I want more certainty. The Lord says, do you not believe? No, I believe. But I want an increase in my certainty. I want to know you better. Are we not asking for the same thing in our lives? My Lord, I want more certainty. I want to understand why. I want to understand who, I want to understand when, I want to understand what my role is. I have 70 years to give you. Give me more certainty. There is this line of du'a, Rabbi zidni ilma, Rabbi zidni yaqeenan. My Lord, increase me in knowledge and increase me in certainty. Ibrahim alayhi salam asked for more certainty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him more certainty. How? He says to him, take those four birds, kill them, cut them, put them upon the, four, upon the four mountains, stand in the middle of the mountains and call them. You will see them rushing towards you. 
The same way, this bird, these birds will come towards you on the day of judgment, everything in creation will come towards me. Every human being will come towards me. Once you've understood it and seen it for yourself, now you will understand how I will do it. Now here the question is very simple. Once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him that certainty, was this randomized? No. What happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to him a dream. He sees that he is slaughtering his own son, Ismail. The fact that I have given you this certainty, I am now going to test you by this very certainty that I have given to you. According to one ahadith, the first day the dream Ibrahim alayhi salam revealed, uh, received, he ignored it. He thought to himself, how can I slaughter my own son? It doesn't make sense to me. It can't have been a correct dream. Next day again, the same dream takes place. Again, he ignores it. No, I can't be slaughtering my own son. Man, this doesn't make sense to me. Third day again, he is given the same dream. Then he goes towards his son Ismail alayhi salam. Oh Ismail, oh my dear son. It is as if I see in a dream that I am slaughtering you. What is your opinion on this matter? Oh my dear father, do as you have been commanded. Inshallah, he will find me of the patient ones. So he comes and blindfolds himself. Another riwayah tells us that before he goes and cuts the throat of what he thinks is his son, Iblis comes to him and gives him waswasa. Oh Ibrahim, how can you kill your own son? This must be Iblis playing on your mind. Look at this. Iblis comes to Ibrahim and says, Iblis must be playing on your mind. Can you see how he's being tested and challenged at every core of the individual that he is? If you were Ibrahim, could you slaughter your own son? And if all of your logic says to you, don't slaughter your own son, you're being tested to your core. And if someone comes to you and says to you, don't slaughter, again, there is a third level which is testing you. My Lord, increase me in my certainty. Fine, I will increase you. But once I increase you, don't think this is going to be the end of it. I will test you with that very gift that I gave to you. It is the same thing in our lives. My Lord, I am ill. I have cancer. Cure me of cancer. Once he has cured me of the cancer, why did he cure me of that cancer? Why did he give me an extra seven years in my life? Was it to remain idle? Or was it because I was supposed to implement something with those final seven years of my life? My Lord, give me wealth. No problem. I will make you the best businessman within Dar es Salaam. Why will I give you this wealth? So that you can do good by it. My Lord, give me family. No problem. I will give you family. Why will I give you family? So that you can make them servants of Ahlul Bayt within the community. Can you see? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing you with everything that He is giving you in accordance with your own existence. I have been given something. Why was I given this? So that I may break forth the shackles that were upon me and give and give and become the complete human being that I was supposed to become. Here we need to now continue in this understanding. What does it mean now to break forth in accordance with my own existence? One. And two, what does it mean when we say completion? These are very ambiguous terms. When I say I'm in the womb and I'm going from stage to stage to stage, I understand it. And when I say in existence, I'm going from adolescence to teen to this to this, I understand it. But here we are not limiting our discussion to the physical. We are saying physically we are growing in a unidirectional manner. I cannot stop myself. But spiritually I'm supposed to be growing also in this very same unidirectional manner. What do I mean when I say I break forth in existence as existence is within myself, stage after stage? And what do we mean when we say completion? What is the meaning of the complete human being who he is? When I look at my own existence, I am now bound to ask more questions. Once I have answered these very fundamental questions as to why have I been born into my family and not your family? 
was, why was I born into this era and not 500 years from now? When I begin to answer those questions, I now go a stage further and ask new questions. I now ask myself, well, who am I? Not why am I, who am I? Because I've already developed 27 and a half years of existence or 40 years of existence or 70 years of existence. So I'm already at the point of answering what existence I have completed within my life. I now begin to ask the questions as who am I? Fine. I have a name. My name is Ja'far. I was given this name by my parents. This is who I am. But I am not me. I am not Ja'far. Because if you were to rename me Muhammad or you were to rename me Ali, I would still be the same individual that I am. Does that make sense? Whatever your name is, if I was to rename you something, you would still be the same you, wouldn't you? You would still have the same strengths that you have. You would still have the same weaknesses that you have. Therefore, your name is not you. Your identity is not you. Who you are is the character that you have built in the existence that you live. That makes sense. You are not you by name. You are you by character. Because if I was to rename you, it doesn't matter what name I give you. I can give you Tom, Dick or Harry. You would still be a good person if you are a good person. And if you were an evil person, you would still be an evil person. If I was to call Yazid Bob, or if I was to call Yazid Ali, Yazid would be Yazid because Yazid is Yazid. And if I was to call Hussein, Zain al Abidin, or if I was to call Hussein Baqir, Hussein would be Hussein because Hussein represents Hussein ibn Ali. He is who he is at the very core of his humanity. This is why I love Hussein. And this is why I have such enmity towards Yazid and what he represents. The name is not you. So, who am I? I am the character. Well, still, that doesn't give me a befitting answer. Who am I? When we talk in terms of ourselves, we normally label ourselves pure and impure. When I say something is pure, I normally label it a color. I say white. White represents a color. Whereas black will represent darkness of the soul, as an example. So if I was to estimate my own soul, what color would I be? Or let me put it to you in a different term. When we normally talk about the soul, we also say that there is the animal that represents. If I am someone who is a very snaky human being, we normally say that they are snake-like. Or if I am someone who just has no control of my animalistic senses, I am a pig. I can't stop eating. I'm just a, a gorge in myself. I take on the pig form. If I was an animal, which shape, which form would I take? Would I be seen as a human being if you were to look at my soul? Would I be seen as an angel if you were to look at my soul? Or would I take on an animal shape within my own form? Remember that famous hadith, fourth Imam, peace be upon him, is performing tawaf. There is a blind man who is performing tawaf with him. Ya ibn Rasulillah. It appears that there are so many people coming to Hajj nowadays. MashaAllah. Imam puts saliva upon his face, lifts the veils from him and grants him vision. Ya ibn Rasulillah. How can this be? There are so many animals performing tawaf around the Holy Kaaba. I see snakes. I see bulls. I see pigs. How can this be that we are allowing these animals to perform tawaf? He says, no, these are not animals. These are human beings. But their insides, their characteristics is so dirty that when you see them now, you see them as the animalistic form. I am me. But who am I? I am not Ja'far, and you are not Muhammad. You are you. But when you analyze yourself, who am I? What character, what shape, what form do I take? Let's go further, ask more pertinent questions. When I see unity and Tawheed, the first thing I see is that Allah Ta'ala is one, but He manifests Himself through different wonderful characteristics. He is Ar-Razaq, He is Ar-Rahman, He is Al-Jawad, He is Al-Kareem. 
when I look at my existence, am I existing in accordance with Tawheed or am I in existence in opposition to Tawheed? What do I mean? When I'm with Mawlana, let us just pick because he's our senior alim here, Sayyid uh, 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 Sheikh Ali Dina. Let us just pick Sheikh Ali Dina. May Allah bless him, grant him long life. If I'm sitting with Sheikh Ali Dina, what side of the character that I have do I present to him? And when I'm with the boys, what character do I present to them? And when I'm with mum, what characteristic do I present to her? Am I in Tawheed where I'm presenting me as to who I am? Or am I presenting the best side of me to Mawlana, but the worst side of me to my friends? Who am I? Have I understood me for who I am? Why is it that when I'm with Shaykh, I will sit humbly and I will talk about good things and I will speak to him in this manner and I want to impress him with my characteristics. So when he goes away, he says, MashaAllah. But when I'm with the boys, I talk all sorts of foul language. I'm talking about all sorts of nonsense. Is he more worthy or are they more worthy? Is he the one who I should be impressing or are they the ones I should be impressing? Or should I be one in existence? Should I be in the state of Tawheed, oneness in existence? How I present myself to him should be the same way I'm presenting myself to them. Have I understood me? Have I understood me? When I say I am bursting forth in accordance with my own journey, this is what it means. I understand me for who I am in accordance with my stage of existence. I am 27 years old. This is what I've achieved in my life. And this is where I'm going for the rest of my life. The hadith says, Man arafa nafsahu faqad arafa rabba. He who knows himself knows his Lord. When I have figured out who I am, why I am, and how I have become to be, only then can I begin to traverse the path of knowing his existence. Commander of the faithful has a hadith where he says, live in this world. The commander of the faithful has a hadith whereby he says, plan in this world as if you are going to live forever, but live in this world as if you are going to die tomorrow. Plan. Have your plans. I want to achieve this and I want to achieve this and I want to do that. I'd love to go visit this country. I want to work with this orphanage. I want to go and complete this book. I want to go... Brilliant. Plan as if you're going to live forever. But live in this world as if you're going to die tomorrow. As if you only have one day to live and I have all these wonderful plans I wanted to fulfill. Go and achieve them. Why are you sitting in front of the TV? Why are you wasting your time? This is what it means to burst forth as the individual that you are. To break the shackles of laziness, the shackles of weakness that have held me down for all of my existence. I am 27 years old. I have achieved this, but I want to go and achieve so much more. Go and do it. What are you waiting for? This is what it means to burst forth from the existence to go and to make who you are and to change that person that you are to eventually becoming the person that you want to be. What does it mean by the term completion? We give a similitude. I am like the butterfly. I cocooned myself. And after I have learned to be in the cocoon, I burst forth as this beautiful butterfly that will flap its wings and go and seek everything that is in front of me. What is completion? How do I understand the completion that is me? I have my weaknesses as a human being. We all have our weaknesses as a human being. Once I have assessed myself and I see the journey that needs to be taken, I now make the plan to achieve that journey so that when I die, I can stand in front of my Lord and thank Him for the time that has been given to me. Nothing is coincidental. If I am given 40 years of existence and you are given 70 years of existence, 
my 40 years I have been given is because those 40 years I am capable of achieving my completion within my 40 years. I don't need 70 years. I am capable of doing it in 40 years. And if you have been given 70 years, it is because those things which you are bound and want to achieve, it is because the 70 years is worthy of your existence in order to complete your own existence. <coughs> Completion. Completion as a human being is to look at me and to remove all those weaknesses in order to become that human being that is perfect for me in accordance with my own time frame. Let me give an example of a perfect human being. By perfect, I don't mean Isma, I don't mean Ahl al-Bayt, I don't mean Abu Fazl Abbas, I don't mean Lady Umm Kurthum, peace be upon her. I mean you and I, people who have achieved perfection within their own selves. Non-Isma based individuals. Ayatollah al adama Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, Rahmatullahi alayhi. This human being was given less than 50 years to live in this world before Saddam al-Takriti murdered him ruthlessly and did what he did. Shaheed Baqar al-Sadr spent his lifetime training his own soul. It was not a day when he was not traversing that path towards completion before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of his actions culminated in that completion whereby when he was tested as a human being to the very core of who he was, he could prove that he became the ultimate human being in front of God. During his youth, his youth, he was a very poor individual. Very, very poor individual. He used to buy books and once he'd finished reading the book, he would sell the book back to the bookstore owner and with that money buy another book. And with that book, he would finish it, sell it back, give it. His mother used to give him lunch money. So imagine he goes to school and of course he would need to buy some food for himself. I can only imagine what it must be like as a youth to walk to school in the heat of Baghdad come back in the afternoons in the heat of Baghdad. As you know, it can be very hot here as well. It's not a simple upbringing. It is a difficult trial and tribulation. Shaheed Baqar al-Sadr, you know what he used to do with that money? I'm talking about at the age of a young teenager. I'm talking 13 years old. This is how he built his character. At 13 years old, 15 years old, when his mother used to give him lunch money, he used to fast instead of taking that lunch money. He would take the lunch money, but he wouldn't tell his mother what he would do with it. He would fast a fast during that day, and with that lunch money, he would go and give that money to the poor people on the streets. One day, because he was very thin at that young age, and his parents noticed that he wasn't eating, they asked him, we're giving you lunch money, we're asking you to eat. Why are you not eating? Listen to the response from Shahid al-Sadr. He says, the reason why I fast during the day is to practice how much hunger I can hold. Because one day if ever I become so poor and I do not have any real money to feed myself with, there will never come a time when I look to the sky and complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about my poverty. I am training myself at 13 years old that should I ever become so poor, I never complain about my poorness towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at how he was, how he would break himself, the boundaries, the bonds, the shackles upon himself. I will go hungry in order to train my own self. If that's what it takes, that's why I will become Shaheed Baqar al-Sadr. There's a story about an incident just before he is martyred. Keep in mind how he is bursting forth as an individual towards his own completion. One day, his house was surrounded by the guards. Guards wouldn't allow anyone to enter and people to exit. There was one very close colleague of Shahid al-Sadr by the name of Sheikh al-Nu'mani. Sheikh al-Nu'mani narrates this story in his book, in his biography. He says, I was in the house of Shahid Baqar al-Sadr. This house was dilapidated. 
It used to leak in the house. But he couldn't actually improve it because he didn't have the money. And the guards of Saddam al-Tikriti would not allow him to improve it. So his children living in the house used to live in a dilapidated house where it used to rain or the heat of it, it would crumble. Even rainwater would come and it would become flowing with water in the house. The guards are surrounding this house. Shaheed al-Sadr is looking through a peephole. You know why? Not just any peephole, bullet holes. He's looking through a peephole that's been made through bullets. He's looking and what does he see? He sees the guards who are stopping people from coming to visit him. Saddam's own guards, he sees them wiping their brow because they are so hot from the heat. He sees them wiping their brow, he sees how hot they are because of the heat. Do you know what he says? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'oon. Shaykh al-Nu'mani, come here. I want you to go and get a jug of water and I want you to get a glass and I want you to go outside and I want you to give water to Saddam's own men and make sure that they are not thirsty. Go and get a jug of water and feed Saddam's own troops and give them water. Shaykh al-Nu'mani responds and he says, Sayyidina, forgive me. And these are his words, I'm quoting them verbatim. Sayyidina, forgive me. Your children are being deprived of even the basic things that children deserve because of these guards. You are housebound and arrested because of these guards. People cannot come to visit you and you cannot leave because of these guards and you want me to give them water. He responds by saying, yes, indeed I do want you to give them water. O oh, Shaykh al-Nu'mani, when you wear the dress of an alim, now this isn't just any alim, we're talking about any human being. Don't just think because you're an amama or you're an abba, this is only about Shaheed al-Sadr. This is every human being. But he says, Shaykh al-Nu'mani, when you, Shaykh al-Nu'mani, when you are an alim and you're in this dress, there is such a high responsibility upon your shoulders. Have you not realized the completion of your own journey? How can you say such a thing? They are human beings. It doesn't matter whether they're enemy, whether they're Saddam's soldiers, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt. These are his words. You have to give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they were born into a family which did not give them good human ethical principles. Maybe they have been taught things about us that are untrue and they genuinely think us to be the enemies of God. How do you know what kind of thinking they have in their mind? How can you say to me that we cannot give them water? You must give them the benefit of the doubt. Go out and give them water. Can you see the level of humanity that Shahid al-Sadr has reached? Your enemy, he is giving him water. And he is teaching the fundamental aspects of growth. You should realize by your age, Shaykh al-Nu'mani, you should realize by the knowledge that you have been gaining, Shaykh al-Nu'mani, that you can't think like this. How can you still think in this way that they are the enemy because they are surrounding us? They are human beings that deserve to be treated as human beings. Break forth from the shackles upon your mind. Go and give to them as they deserve to be given. Shaykh al-Nu'mani goes out and gives them water. He returns with a message by the captain, the captain of that army who was standing outside. The words from the captain of Saddam al-Tikriti's own men, O Baqir al-Sadr, may Allah bless you. Keep up your struggle because these people are fearing you and they are scared of the revolution that is coming from your hands. What revolution? The revolution by his characteristics. Shaheed al-Sadr as the individual died 30 years ago. Shaheed al-Sadr as the character lives on. Shaheed al-Sadr as the human being passed away from this world. Shaheed al-Sadr as the representative of God lives on. 
Why? Because he wasn't Shaheed Baqir al-Sadr by his name. He was Shaheed al-Sadr by the human being that he was. وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ يُقْتَلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتِ بَلْ أَحْيَاء وَلَا كِلَّا تَشْعَرُونَ Do not consider those who have died in the way of Allah as dead. Nay, they are alive, but you and I do not perceive how. When I say completion, I mean completion of your humanity. I am a Shia of Ahl al-Bayt. I should act as a Shia of Ahl al-Bayt. I'm not a Shia of Muawiyah. I shouldn't think like Muawiyah. I'm not a Shia of Yazid. I'm a Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib. When he saw someone hungry and thirsty along the road, he stopped for them. When he saw someone who was in need, he gave to them. When he, went, when he went and realized that he couldn't sleep because someone else was in need, he couldn't sleep. This is where we are trying to get to. This is the end goal of whom I am wanting to be. I want to be a complete human being that at all times, no matter what I am shaken with, even if it is Saddam's own guards, I do not leave the characteristic that is befitting of a human being. And that is who I am supposed to be. There is so much more that we want to say on this topic, but maybe we'll have to cut it short here and maybe even pick it up for a third discussion tomorrow before we move on. If you want to see a human being complete himself, look no, for, look no further than the 10th of Muharram. I want to say to my younger brothers and sisters that the event of Karbala from the day in which Abi Abdullah wasalam, was demanded allegiance by Walid, by Marwan. From that day until the end of Karbala, when Ahl al Bayt returned back to the city of Medina on, after Arba'in, the entire Karbala is the university of Islam. There is no facet of Islam that is not found within that first day to the last day. The culmination of it is the 10th of Muharram. And the culmination of the 10th of Muharram is the martyrdom of Abi Abdullah. When we talk about someone who is breaking forth at every level of humanity, you may kill and slaughter my son in front of me. But I will still ask you to come towards Islam. Look at the sermon of Hussein as he enters the battlefield. Salamullah alayhi. Do you not know that I am the grandson of Rasulullah? Do you not know that I am the grandson of Ali ibn Abi, uh, I am the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib? Do you not know that I am the son of Fatima? Do you not know that I am from the household of Hamza? Do you not know that from my household Ja'far flies in heaven with wings? Yes, we do. Then why do you kill me? He's still calling them towards Islam. It's not for him. He is not selfish. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that matters at all points on that day. On that day, when he is being slaughtered, when he has arrows embedded into his chest, he comes to the river Euphrates. He comes down and instead of giving himself water, he turns towards his horse Zuljanah. Oh horse of mine, you are more thirsty than I. Come and take this water. Look at the humanity of Hussein. He is bursting forth. It doesn't matter what trial and tribulation I have. I will not shake. I am the human being that I deserve to be. And then comes the point of his martyrdom. Please understand his martyrdom. What do our ahadith tell us? He is burdened with arrows to the extent that he has to pull one from his back. It entered the front, he has to pull it from the back. One man throws a rock upon the forehead of Abi Abdullah. They begin to encircle Hussein ibn Ali. None of them can strike Hussein. Why? Because they narrate, the more we strike him, the more beautiful his face is becoming in front of us. What does this mean, this beauty of this face? They say we cannot kill him. One man says, I swear by Allah, 
I have never seen a person more bludgeoned to death, more in a state where he's been cut to pieces, yet he is, he is more beautiful. I have never seen a person more beautiful than Hussein ibn Ali. Why? Because every trial and tribulation, Hussein welcomed it with an open arms. If it's for the sake of Allah and for the sake of my own existence and completion of my story, it doesn't matter. I will continue to shed blood after blood after blood. I became more beautiful the more I was being struck down. It is the same with us. The more we are being struck, the more trial and tribulation, the more I should be bursting forth, the more nur that should be emanating from my own face. This is the ultimate human being when it comes to completion. And on the 10th of Muharram, that is why his face shone the more and more strikes he took upon his head. And then Shimmer comes and begins to take him. Sayyidah Zainab runs into the battlefield. Oh my dear brother Hussein, what is it that I am seeing? I am seeing the earth shake at this very moment in time. Oh Hussein, how can I bear this trial after you? Oh Hussein, if only the skies were to fall upon you at this very moment in time. There is a hadith that says that as Sayyidah Zainab was standing on Tilla Zainabiyah, as she was standing upon that mountain, she cried out, O oh mountain, raise me higher so I may see what is happening to my brother. At the same time, Hussein called out, O oh Tilla, O oh mountain, O oh hillside, become smaller so that my sister does not have to see what is taking place to me. Sakina runs towards the battlefield. The children are calling out, Wa Husayna. At this point in time, a shimmer is striking the blessed neck of Hussein. Who is there? Who is there to see this momentous occasion in history? Fatima the Zahra extends her arms. Oh my beloved Hussein, drop your head into my arms. I will hold you. If there is no other human being to hold you at this time, your mother Fatima will not let you go at this time. Allah <laughs> la'natullah ya al-qawm al-zalimin. وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي من قلب ينقلبون إن لله وإن إليه راجعون. Please raise your hands. Let us join each other in du'a. We pray to Allah سبحانه وتعالى for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior. يا الله, we are such desperately in need of His coming. Hasten it, hasten it, يا الله, hasten it. We ask you, Ya Allah, to allow us to be alongside Him at all times in our life and in our death. If we are passing from this world before He is to make His reappearance, raise us from our graves so that we can be alongside Him to partake in His victory. We ask you, Ya Allah, there are many people around the world who are in desperate need. We are receiving reports today in the rest of Africa. There are problems in Ethiopia. There are problems in Nigeria. We read that there are problems in Saudi, we read there are problems in Yemen, in Egypt, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Bahrain, in Palestine, in Syria, in Mexico. Ya Allah, grant them safety, security, peace, education and medicine. We ask you, Ya Allah, to forgive our sins, the sins of our parents, all those whom we love, all those that love us, all of our marhumeen, all of our ulama and all of our leaders. We ask you, Ya Allah, Help us to understand this Qur'an. Help us to understand the purpose of our lives. Help us to understand the month of Ramadan and complete it as you have ordained. We ask you, Ya Allah, help us to perform the ziyarat of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them all. We ask you, Ya Allah, in the final moments of our life, a shaitan comes to us and is tricking us and wants to give us water. We ask you that it is Hussein ibn Ali that comes to us and quenches our thirst. We ask you, Ya Allah, for the opportunity to die in the love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May I ask you to bless this sitting with a loud salawat in honor of our third Imam, Abi Abdullah al-Hussein, Sayyid al-Shuhada, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi.